Well, welcome everybody and welcome uh, to the LSE, welcome to Another Europe is Possible, welcome to DM25, welcome to Open Democracy. I think today's meeting could be one of the most important that any of us have ever attended. I think what happened on June the 23rd was a terrible tragedy for this country. And what I find really alarming is the speed at which this terrible tragedy is unfolding. Uh, what we saw last week was systematic anti-immigrationist rhetoric. Uh, we saw Jeremy Hunt talking about a, a UK-only uh, NHS. We saw Amber Rudd talking about statistics on foreign workers and businesses. Michael Fallon saying we've got to reintroduce military training in schools. Um, and, you know, what I think is so dangerous is that we can't actually control immigration. And so what the consequences of fueling this anti-immigration sentiment is truly alarming. Now, the Brexiteers said their slogan was take back control. What we've learned is that taking back control means taking control by an unaccountable, unelected, extreme right-wing cabal consisting of Theresa May, Boris Johnson, Liam Fox, and David Davis. And I also think that Labour MPs were responsible because at that historic moment after Brexit, when we really needed people to speak out for human and democratic values, they were totally preoccupied with power inside the Labour Party. So I think today is about a campaign of resistance to what's happening. Um, I think we need to press for freedom of movement, which we realized on June the 24th is so precious. Uh, we need to celebrate <coughs> diversity and cosmopolitanism in this country. We need to support education, science, uh, and learning, which has to be global. But above all, we need to press for democratic ways of doing things, and that is not populism. That is genuine participation, debate, and the use of public reason. So I think particularly important is going to be pressing for transparency in the Brexit negotiations. And I think we have to demand that Article 50 cannot be triggered without a vote in Parliament. That's got to be very important. And finally, what I want to say is that we're still part of Europe. We're part of Europe politically, culturally, geographically, but above all, politically. We actually need Europe to save us from this extreme right-wing lurch. Um, we need Europe. We, we can't any longer, in an era of globalization, have social justice and green policies um, in one country. So we need Europe to be able to address global challenges like climate change, like uh, regulating and taxing multinational corporations, like addressing the really dangerous conflicts like Syria in the world. Um, and so I think it's going to be very important for us to reach out to other progressive pan-European movements uh, who are campaigning for the same things. That's going to be crucial part of what we do. And we're very lucky to have Yanis Varoufakis and DM25 here today. And we do need to join forces to press for the democratization of Europe. So welcome, and I hope we have a very good and productive day.
So welcome to our first panel session of what went wrong and what next. And this is making sense of the EU referendum. And today we will be talking for about um, an hour and five minutes. And don't forget to use the hashtag um, if you're in the audience or if you're on the live stream using LSE Brexit. So please get involved on Twitter and social media. Today we've got Owen Jones, Ash Sakar, Zoe Gardner and Yanis Varoufakis. And um, we'll be talking for about 10 minutes each and then oh, if there's time we will open it to questions. So I'll pass you over to begin with to Owen Jones who's a Guardian col columnist. Col oh, apparently. communist that sounds like. <laughs> oh right Owen, sounds about right. <laughs> the Daily Mail are going to have this <laughs> as their front page article tomorrow. <laughs> Um, and so I'll pass you over to Owen, who probably can speak better than I can on this Saturday morning. <laughs> um, blimey. Well, uh, morning, everyone. Um, I remember when it feels like a different world away. Uh, the opening launch meeting of another Europe is Possible a few months ago, I spoke on the platform with Yanis and others, and it was the beginning of uh, a uh, all over the country, a national tour of another Europe is Possible meetings. And we tried to galvanise a progressive case for remain and change. And we warned of the terrible consequences that would unfold if we left the European Union on the terms, of course, of this Conservative government. And I'm afraid to say that those predictions, of course, uh, are unfolding now uh, before us. This is a time of national crisis and national emergency. It's a time of crisis and emergency, not just in this country, but across the Western world. The forces of xenophobic and racist populism are on the march from the United States to Poland, from Britain to Greece, Austria, Sweden, across the entire European continent. It is a time of grave, grave danger. And that's why this is so important. We have to fight back. If our voices fall silent at this moment, then we are complicit in what happens next. And the danger is this, in the past few years we've warned time and time again, that if we don't get our act together, then we will be swept away by a deluge of those who promote uh, markets rigged in favour of a tiny elite, untrammeled markets and a society rigged in favour of the rich. It's got worse. We now risk being swept away by racist and xenophobic populism. It is not it could hardly be more serious. This is the gravest time since 1945. And I say this because often when I talk, I like to talk about hope, and I'll hopefully get there by the end, that we need to spell out what we're up against. We need to have a wake-up call, all of us. We need to be aware of what we're dealing with. Now, I think sometimes, particularly in England as opposed to Britain, there's a kind of English exceptionalism, that we, don't under we only understand political developments in this country in isolation, but it is, of course, linked to what's happening everywhere. Donald Trump, the National Front in France, Golden Dawn in Greece, uh, the Austrian far right, as I said, the Swedish Democrats. This populism on the right is on the march. And what we've seen, of course, since 2008 in particular, is this polarisation. So we have, as well, of course, new movements of the left here in this country, or Bernie Sanders or Podemos. And the question now facing all of us is which side wins? If there's another economic crisis, then there is a vacuum still waiting to be filled. And they're ready and they're waiting, the Le Pens and the Trumps, or if they manage, if he loses, and they find someone who's more presentable to extol the same right-wing demagoguery uh, that he has. Now, when we think about what's happened, though, in this country, in particular, during that referendum, and this is an attack on the Leave voters. It's so important to say this. Whenever you criticise the Leave campaign, there's a disingenuous uh, response that this is an attack on the majority of people in this country who voted to leave the European Union. And that's not the point I'm making. The argument we have is with an official Leave campaign who ran a campaign based on xenophobia, racism and lies. And the worst thing is, when I say lies, is they didn't believe it, most of them themselves. It was a completely cynical exercise which stirred up racism and xenophobia in this country, in some cases like our new Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson, worth uh, just stating that, just so we're again aware of how bad uh, the consequences have been. Uh, a man, obviously, with a track record of overt racism, who is now the Foreign Secretary. 
Uh, but nonetheless, these are people who did it, of course, for cynical political gain. And what did they do? They lied about Turkey joining the European Union and then said we'd be swamped by Turkish criminals. They spoke of immigrants as rapists and murderers. They unveiled lists of people from the European Union who'd committed uh, heinous crimes. Uh, they uh, demonised and attacked refugees and immigrants. Nigel Farage stood in front of that poster. Do you remember Breaking Point? Pictures of refugees who fled terrible violence. And actions have consequences. And the aftermath, of course, of that referendum was a surge in hate attacks. And people at this moment who are living in fear need the solidarity of all of us. And one task of this movement is to stand in solidarity with those who are now on the receiving end of the hatred whipped up by privileged politicians for cynical political gain. Now, if we look at what happened in terms of the breakdown of that European, of the EU referendum, obviously there was a difference in age. Younger Britons voted decisively uh, to stay. Now, originally, and this is where we, you know, you do have to get a bit of hope out, don't you? Uh, originally, it was suggested that turnout amongst people who were 18 to 25 was only 35%, which was a horrifying statistic, which turned out to be wrong, fortunately. 65% of uh, 18 to 25 year olds came out and voted, a massive increase from the general election. And that is heartening, and something I think which is worth building on uh, in the months ahead. Uh, but class, now cl we, we speak partly of, of the class breakdown because it was only the professional middle classes where a majority voted uh, to remain in the European Union. But of course we need to be a bit more nuanced than that because the working class is not homogenous. It's made up of people from all sorts of different backgrounds. The working class has never been uh, more diverse. Millions of working class people voted to remain, including a majority of working class people from black and minority <laughs> ethnic backgrounds, including, of course, here in London, in Manchester, in Birmingham, and other big major cities uh, across uh, the country. But of course, there's no point pretending otherwise that there was a class dimension. Now, I grew up in Stockport. Stockport voted narrowly uh, to remain in the European Union. But that's only because it included the suburbs of Cheshire, where 75 to 80% of people voted uh, to remain. Where I grew up in Stockport, people voted to leave. Now, there were many, many problems where I grew up, and there were very, very few immigrants. In fact, there were barely any immig immigrants at all. And this is a pattern partly replicated across the country. Often the areas with the least immigrants are the areas with the highest levels of anti-immigration sentiment, and that includes where I grew up. Now, there are many problems where I grew up, as I've said. A lack of affordable housing because of the failure of successive governments to build the housing that we need. A lack of secure jobs because of the failure of successive governments to defend those jobs uh, with policies that have ripped out decent, skilled, middle-income jobs from our economy which haven't been replaced. Living standards that have stagnated or fallen because of policies of cuts, sucking demand out the economy, uh, the undermining of trade unions, the form of globalisation we've had, and so on. Whether it be, of course, the, uh, um, many, uh, the uh, what I said, housing, living standards, jobs, services. The <laughs> failure, it's public services under strain, again, because of cuts, the worst cuts since the 1920s. Now, where I grew up, many people looked at these problems through the prism of immigration, in a place where there are very, very few immigrants indeed. And that was a failure of the left, of people like myself, of the labour movement as a whole, that we failed to come up with a convincing message that understands and explains the problems that millions of people have because of a society that puts profit ahead of people's needs and aspiration, a society rigged in favour of a tiny elite. And one of the problems has been the stripping away of class politics. Now, the danger was always, and we're seeing it now, that when class was stripped out of the debate, the right at some point would cynically themselves hijack the language of class. And that's what they're doing now. Theresa May, who's been in government, uh, spoke in a speech of how ordinary working class people have had to pay the, the price for a crisis caused by the financial sector, as though she was a disinterested observer for the last few years, <laughs> rather than one of the pillars of a government that have failed to build housing, cut public services, and in work benefits, and made working class people pay for a crisis in the way she explained. Incredible, astonishing behaviour. Satire has been bludgeoned to death by Theresa May, but nonetheless. But it's an absolute, it's a, it's a critical point. What they're now trying to do, and this is why it's so dangerous, this is what right-wing populism has long tried to do in the United States and is doing here now, 
is to redefine, if you like, working class identity as being under threat by a metropolitan liberal elite which wants to destroy their way of life, that hates their values and is wedded to immigration, a, which is the main source of all the woes in this country. And it is lethal. And we have to be aware of what they're going to do because both UKIP and the Conservative parties now are absolutely dedicated to that form of lethal right-wing uh, populism, which is trying to, as I've said, redirect working class frustrations which are based on real grievances at all the wrong targets. And we've got to be aware of that, which is why class politics is absolutely essential and how class intersects with gender, uh, race, sexuality, and so on. Now, in terms of what we, in terms of the months ahead, the dangers are this. Clearly, as a consequence of the harsh, chaotic Brexit, which is now on offer, there will be massive economic dislocation of some description. And I can't, we can't predict exactly what that will be, when it will be, and how it will manifest itself. But it is clearly coming, and it's a threat to the living standards of people in this country. And millions of working class people who voted to leave are going to be the ones who suffer the most. And the danger is, they're not going to go, well, this whole Brexit was based on lies. But they will instead feel, in the absence of an inspiring alternative, that immigration is even more of a problem that has to be dealt with, that immigrants will come under more attack and more scapegoating. And that's the danger that I think we face in the years ahead, because we know, as Theresa May herself described, that when economic crisis and dislocation happens, it's working class people who pay the greatest price. So we have to do lots of different things. We have to defend uncompromisingly immigrants and people of colour and people from minority communities from the prejudice and bigotry that's now being unleashed. Britain, 2016, when a government is talking about, about drawing up lists of foreign workers, of kicking out the nurses and doctors and care workers who tended people in this room and saved the lives of our relatives who brought children into the world and look after the aged and the sick every single day and now being told that they're a problem, a burden that needs to be chucked out of this country. So we have to be absolutely clear, or uncompromising, against that tide of racism and xenophobia. And we've got to get our act together in terms of actually coming up with a clear, coherent alternative that answers people's everyday problems and grievances on all the problems that I've described from housing, jobs, wages, and so on. It's for the Labour leadership to do that, the Labour movement, and for all of us in this room to do so as well. So that, I hope, is partly what this day is all about. It's about how we actually build that movement so that in the coming months and the coming years, instead, if you like, of a Brexit, which becomes an intratory debate, a debate between the likes of the, you know, the Anna Soubrys and the Nicky Morgans who oppose the terms of Brexit being offered, and then Liam Fox and David Davis and Boris Johnson. If it becomes a debate between those two wings, that is a calamity for millions of people in this country. So we have to be more vocal, and that means a clear, coherent message it means we need clear leadership with clear lines that all of us can take into our communities. Hundreds of thousands of people have joined the Labour Party. Momentum is brimming with enthusiasm of thousands of people who've joined. Every time there was a hatchet job, I'm a bit annoyed, the media have been a bit light on momentum now, so I think their recruits are probably going now. But we have hundreds of thousands of people in this country. But we've got to start going out into our communities. It's good turning up to rallies and meetings like this, but we need clear, concrete plans about how we reach the people who don't turn up to these meetings, who don't turn up to the rallies, who don't, aren't talking on Twitter in the way people like me spend half my life doing about politics. So let's think in the days ahead. This day has to be practical. How do we come up with that clear alternative? How do we communicate it? How do we go out in those communities? And if we do that, and we have that international perspective, because this struggle is being fought everywhere, as I've said, and an injury to one is an injury to us all, we've got to link up with people in Spain, in Italy, I know there are people in Italy here today, in the United States, people in Hungary, a leftist newspaper has just been closed by the authoritarian right-wing anti-immigrant government in Hungary today. We have to link up with these progressive movements all over Europe and in the United States. And if we have that international movement with a clear, credible, inspiring alternative to a society rigged in favour of a tiny elite, then we will push back the forces of right-wing xenophobia uh, and nascent fascism. We've done it before, 
and we will do it again. But it needs leadership and it needs every single person in this room and all the people who turned up to this and are watching this on the live stream to start doing, as many of us are already doing, I'm sure, but going out into our communities and providing that inspiring alternative to build a different sort of society that doesn't scapegoat immigrants, but is running the interest of the majority. Thank you. Thank you very much, Owen. Um, I'm going to pass you on to Ash next, who is the senior editor at Navarra Media. Hi. Um, I kind of feel you should have dropped the mic after that, Owen. That was amazing. <laughs> um, thanks so much for having me on this amazing panel for the season finale of UK politics. And um, I guess, <laughs> I guess, Shami Chakrabarti has got better things to do these days. So um, thanks for calling me. Um, there are two things that I want to talk about, and like Owen, I do want to cover this really important ground of what went wrong. But what I also want to focus on and spend some time unpicking is that our ways of making sense of what went wrong regarding the EU referendum are in themselves still <coughs> faulty. Um, our analysis isn't where it should be. And then maybe I can end on a hopeful note, but to be honest, like, spoiler alert, I'm just going to say burn it all down. Um, <laughs> So hold on to your melanin, because I'm going to be talking about race a lot. So the more I think about the events of June 23rd, the more I come to this conclusion that by the time the EU referendum had been called, it had already been lost, which sounds like a downer. Um, and I'm not blowing anyone's mind by suggesting that there's a connection between Brexit and racism, right? The 58% spike in reported racial hate, hate attacks um, bear some witness to this. And I'm not blowing anyone's minds by saying that this was a referendum that was fought on immigration. And there's been a ton of data that's been thrown around to back this up. But what there hasn't been much of is an analysis of what that data means. Now, full disclosure, I'm an English lit student. So if I get numbers wrong, just someone yell at me or throw something at me because this is not my forte. Um, one of the stats that was being thrown around a lot was that 81% of people who thought that immigration and multiculturalism were bad things in our society, voted leave. Now, that's been misrepresented and misreported as 81% of leave voters thought multiculturalism and immigration was a bad thing. And this sounds like splitting hairs. And at first, when someone pointed out that difference to me, I was like, don't care. Um, and then after it was patiently explained to me why I ought to care, I realized that the difference in that statistics is the, is the difference between the Leave campaign more effectively sowing racist lies, a xenophobic narrative, and people buying it, and the Leave campaign effectively mobilizing and consolidating the xenophobic and racist sentiments that were already there. And that's the thing that I want to talk about today. The climate that we find ourselves in now, which is by turns terrifying and absurd, is the result of a project at least 15 years in the making. Actually, no, wait, it started in 1492 at the start of colonialism, but I, I realize that we're, we're pushed for time. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start I'm gonna start with 15 years ago as opposed to 1492. You'll be very relieved to know. Let's talk about this word that's been thrown around to criticize Jeremy Corbyn a lot, this word electability. And let's think about how electability is this you know, shapeless, formless property which seems to belong to the right, right? So winning votes meant not only neoliberal economic policies, privatization, it also meant xenoracist policies, right? So ones that made us suspicious of not just freedom of movement, but the presence of people of color in our society. So let's think about what happened between 2001 and now, right? So between 2002 and 2004, with David Blunkett as Home Secretary, asylum applications um, that were successfully granted were halved in that time. In that same time, there was a 20% increase in racist hate attacks, right? So we're starting to throw around numbers which start to reflect or hint at the situation that we find ourselves in now. In 99, 1999, very famously, the McPherson Report came out, right? And that's where we get this phrase, institutional racism, right? A really powerful phrase. Because institutional racism says that racism isn't just a matter of 
someone pops off or tries to beef you on the streets. Because if that was the case, racism would have ended in the 1980s when my mum was at her prime fighting age, right? Institutional racism recognises that racism is reproduced through our politics, through our institutions. There's a connection between discourses and behaviours between the establishment and individuals. So 1999 was a big moment, right, for the McPherson Report to come out and say institutional racism is a thing. Didn't last that long. By 2003, David Blunkett, again, said that this slogan, institutional racism, missed the point because it failed to acknowledge how individuals replicate racism. And it's like, mate, thanks for taking us back like four years. So what was going on at that time? Yes, you had the 2000 Race Relations Act in which immigration officers were made exempt. So it meant that immigration officers had a free hand to racially profile and target communities like Tamils, Kurds, Albanians, Somalis. Again, we're starting to recognize some of the climate that we find ourselves in now, way back in 2002. And there was an article with um, a BNP councillor around this time who said that they could not believe their luck that New Labour had become obsessed with the asylum issue. And he said, we have the luxury of banging on people's doors with the mainstream issue of the day. Right? So here you've got this connection between what we consider the moderate center ground of politics and the extreme far right, and one is strengthening the other. And right, I'm an equal opportunities hater here, so let's move on to the Conservative Party. Um, David Cameron, in February 2011, said that multiculturalism has failed. He said, we have even tolerated segregated communities behaving in ways that run counter to our values. And he wasn't talking about like arcane pig-related rituals at the Gavston Society. Um, <laughs> He was talking about Muslims, right? My lot. Um, what's interesting is when he made the speech, it was on the same day as the EDL's single biggest mobilization in Luton to date. So we don't have a case of fringe politics invading the center, as often these things are framed in leftist and liberal circles. What you have is a case of the center happily traipsing after the hard right, the, the hard right wing vote, right? And this was replicated again and again um, over the course of the e EU referendum. Rightly, Owen pointed out just how racialized the imagery around immigration was at that time, so the breaking point image. Um, when we were talking about migration, yes, ostensibly it was about EU migration, but actually the images that were forming that were about who's on the borders of Europe, right? Not who's already in Europe, but who's on the borders, so Syrian refugees, um, migrants who are landing at Lampedusa, um, Turkish people, and then you have people who are, I'd like to call contingently white. They're white for as long as they don't present a problem or it's convenient for them not to, not to be, such as Poles, Romanians, etc. So why is this happening? Why do you have such awful racist imagery on the one hand, and why do you have the so-called centre ground chasing this imagery, chasing this vote? And I think we need to move beyond this analysis that it's the result of austerity and it's the result of scarcity. And I think this comes to problem two for me, which is that our analysis of Brexit replicates the very conditions that allowed it to happen in the first place. So let's talk about class, right? Let's talk about the immediate framing of Brexit as being the result of forgotten communities of white working class people exercising a protest vote against the establishment. So I don't know about you, but I was stupid enough to stay up and watch the whole thing um, with my friend getting increasingly drunk and sad. And <laughs> it, was, it was horrible. It was the worst night. Um, and when we were watching it, we noticed an immediate switch from this is a surprise to this is not a surprise. This is a result of austerity. And they started using this phrase, white working class. And at first, I was like scoffing at this. And I was like, this is a phrase that is totally empty of content. And then started unpicking it a bit. Why is it that we think of the white working class? Right? Where are the working class communities of color in this, a community that I myself grew up in? We need to challenge this narrative and challenge it hard. And one thing is something that is done on the left, and I'm pleased to see it done, is challenging the causal link proposed between migration and scarcity, right? Or cultural difference and societal divisions, right? We're very good at saying, um, it's not immigration that causes scarcity, it's austerity. We're very good at saying it's not culture that engenders difference, it's economic inequality. 
but we're not, what we're not good at talking about is challenging this framing of the white working class in the first place. So we can talk about Barnsley being a constituency that's been forgotten by the political classes. But then how do you make sense of Broxbourne, which voted overwhelmingly for leave? I don't know if you've been to Broxbourne, but it's got a hench m &S which has been doing sterling business even post-2008, so not that hard hit by austerity. And when we look at who is hardest hit by austerity and we look at racial breakdowns, this complicates this picture even further. So the Runnymede Trust came out with some statistics showing that you were two times more likely to be amongst those hardest hit by austerity if you weren't white. Research by the TUC showed that people of color are overrepresented amongst those in precarious contracts, so thinking zero hours, that kind of thing, and part-time labor more likely to be earning less money as well, more likely to be unemployed. So race isn't merely a distraction from class composition, right? Racism isn't merely false consciousness. Race makes up class composition itself. It forms part of that material basis. And this is something that the left doesn't talk about. So how do we respond to this? Often the response is, well, we should be punching up, not down, right? We should encourage disaffected white working class people to realize they've got more in common with their, with their neighbors who are people of color than disaffected cosmopolitan elites, et cetera, et cetera. And this was a line that I bought until this week when I saw Theresa May's utterly terrifying speech at the Tory party conference, right? So I'm gonna just quote a little bit. She, talk, she was reminding us of the uh, bonds and obligations that make our society work, a commitment to the men and women who live around you, recognizing the social contract that says you train up young local people before you take on cheap labor from overseas. Too many people in positions of power believe they have more in common with international elites than the people that they pass in the street. But if you believe you are a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere. Now, rhetorically, at least, this is punching up, right? And if I was doing Theresa May's PR, I would be punching the air right now because she's very effectively just yanked some of that, no pun intended, momentum away from Jeremy Corbyn in terms of corralling anti-establishment sentiment. And if you were to just take that chunk from her speech and you didn't know who had said it, you might be forgiven for thinking that it came from Occupy back in 2011, or even, dare I say it, it was said by one of us on this panel right here, including myself. So what do we need to do when we look at these bits in Theresa May's speech? Do we just say, this is hypocrisy? Do we say, you are part of the establishment, this is on you? Or do we stop and do we think and do we reflect and realize that the language of social and economic uplift isn't inherently emancipatory, right? It isn't necessarily subversive if you decouple it from anti-racism. I want to move on to some of Amber Rudd's comments, right? So quite um, famously, James O'Brien was reading um, sections from Mein Kampf and saying it was, uh, you know, bore an uncanny resemblance to what Amber Rudd was saying. And while I'm inclined to agree, and I think that's important to Im impress on us the seriousness of what's going on at the moment, again, we need to move beyond that spectacle of fear of just proclaiming how scared we are and actually get to doing some proper political analysis. One of the <laughs> things that she said was, this is the UK and there is an unequivocal rule of law. If you live here, you abide by that law. And that is said in the same party conference at which Theresa May criticizes so-called socialist human rights lawyers for haranguing our armed forces and says that, that, that British armed forces should be exempt from the Human Rights Act. What we have here isn't hypocrisy. What we have here isn't a lack of conceptual clarity. What we've got here is racism shaping politics in action, right? What we have is a redrawing of the lines of who is of the public and who is not of the public, who is the law and who is subject to the law. And I think that's a criticism that we really have to push and explore. And of, of course, I'm not saying that racism has no relationship to economic hardships, you know, the economic hardships engendered by austerity, but we do need to look at how, at how even leftist discourses have been complicit in fueling a sense of white aggrievement. And this sense of white aggrievement, as you rightly pointed out, is a global phenomenon. We see it in Australia, we see it in America, we see it in France, we see it in Germany, we see it here. So what is to be done? Um, other than burn it down, which I am leaning towards, um, <laughs> just as the left was asking 
where the hell is Labour during the e EU referendum? Radical people of colour have been asking where the hell are you for years. This is a time for solidarity, but for solidarity to actually mean something, we need to think about what white people, what allies need to be committing themselves to. Um, Europe will not save us from racism. The EU will not save us from racism. Um, I voted Remain. I encourage people to vote Remain. But I never lost sight of the fact that it fundamentally is a racist institution which has blood on its hands, right? The blood of the countless migrants who have drowned in the Mediterranean, for instance. And you only have to look at what's going on in France under Hollande to look at the kind of racism that can be done in the name of progressive socialism or in the name of European identity. So I don't see that as an emancipatory model. I think what we need to do is look at some of the projects and initiatives that are going on now, right? We can't just define ourselves into existence as a movement. We need to look at where it's happening now. I think there are three things that it would be great to see people commit their time and their energy to, and all three are projects of non-compliance, which is one of my favorite words in the world. So thing number one is the ABC school project, right? Which is encouraging people not to participate when schools ask for the nationality and citizenship data from children, right? In these letters, it's explicitly said that white British children are exempt. And if that's not an example of institutional racism in our schools, I don't know what is. Second project would be Docs Not Cops, right? So these are doctors who are organizing amongst themselves to resist implementing the prevent agenda and resist implementing, once again, collecting the citizenship data, which Theresa May's made such a like hoo-ha about. Um, yeah, in order to monitor how many foreigners are amongst us. Um, spoiler, it's loads of us. We're everywhere. <laughs> and thing number three would be lend your support to organizations such as Black Lives Matter UK, such as Tell Mama, who are already out there on the streets helping people of color feel safer in living their everyday lives. So yeah, those are three things that I'd like to see. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much for that, Ash. Um, I'm now going to hand you over to Zoe Gardner, who is an uh, asylum rights advocacy um, worker and um, a tireless grassroots campaigner and has worked with Another Europe as Possible. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here on a Saturday. Thank you, everyone who's watching, probably from bed at home. Good choice. <laughs> uh, I'm going to get right into this. We've had two brilliant uh, speakers. We've got another very exciting one coming up, and we've got a whole day of desperately needed conversations to be had. Um, I think we've all been in a lot of shock, but now we've really, really, it's our moment to stake our claim to the right side of history and do some of the things that Ash has just been talking about, or even better, all three. Um, as a you know, Ramona in chief, and someone who spends too much time on Twitter. I have been lectured a huge amount recently, I'm sure some of you have too, about democracy. Now, leaving aside criticisms of how democratic uh, that referendum really can be claimed to be, um, let's just look at our government right now. And talking of democracy, can anybody tell me, did we ever actually elect UKIP? I don't remember that. But even UKIP, are shocked at what we're seeing coming out of this government now. Um, this is the kind of room where people maybe listen to the Today program on Radio 4 in the morning. They maybe even do it on a Saturday. If you listened this morning, you may have heard um, Roger Helmer. Uh, he's an MEP for UKIP. He is well known for saying things such as, well, when rape happens in relationships, it's different because women have established a reasonable set of expectations with their boyfriends. Um, he's also famous for saying that uh, homophobia doesn't really exist. It's just a PC way of talking about what you know, conventional thinking is. So he's a great guy. And he was on the radio this morning. <laughs> he was on the radio this morning 
saying that Tory immigration policies, he was like, I'm very happy. They were talking, of course, about the fact that the front runner at the moment for the new UKIP leadership um, is uh, somebody who's been considering defecting to the Tories because obviously the Tories have adopted all of UKIP's policies. Um, he was saying how happy he was about that, but then he said, oh yes, but some of this anti-foreigner stuff has really gone too far. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you. Um, this is where we're at. We have a government whose entire policy agenda is driven by a ridiculous uh, anti-immigrant rather than anti-immigration agenda. Um, a target to bring immigration, net immigration down to the tens of thousands that will never be achieved. And I, seeing this and despairing, as I'm sure many of you have been doing too over the last few days in the Tory party conference and Brexit being you know, a 52% uh, vote to leave the EU being in, taken as a license to drag us into this gusser of racist filth. Um, I, I'm drawn to mind my, my GCSE theatre studies classes where I learned about a theorist, a French theorist uh, in the 1930s called Antonin Artaud. And he uh, came up with this theory of the theatre of cruelty, which I think is a very good way of uh, looking at what the Tories are doing at the moment, what our government is doing in the name of uh, democratic mandates to in implement Brexit. Um, obviously, theatre of cruelty, you, get, you see what I'm getting at here, but what Arthur's point was about this theatre was that it was intended as, it was to be addressed first of all to the senses rather than to the mind. And I think that that's really what these policies are doing. They are absolute theatrics and they are appealing to people's emotions and they're not thought through uh, credible policies and we should not be accepting them. They are a nonsense and they, um, they're such a nonsense that they've actually gone into a world of complete doublespeak. So for example you take a, a, a policy that is sensible and that is credible, the Migration Impact Fund, um, and they've decided to rebrand this a controlling immigration fund. Um, and so instead of being used to support communities where there is a fast influx of immigration, Im immigrants to the area so that local councils can invest in you know, school places, uh, integration measures, uh, English language classes, translation, uh, you know, supporting local services to deal with the change in population. Um, we're going to have that fund used to further criminalize um, and further marginalize the most vulnerable in our society, the undocumented people that, you know, using a different language, the Home Secretary and the Prime Minister want, say they want to protect because they go on and on about the victims of modern slavery. I'll tell you who they are. They're refugees. So let's use the language that actually applies to the right people here. Those people, refugees, uh, undocumented victims of trafficking, those are the people that that fund will be used to push further and further into the hands of their exploiters. They will not get rid of anybody. And how are they going to pay for it? Because we did have a migration impact fund before, you know. Um, for a couple of years, it was brought in by Gordon Brown. It was then scrapped by the coalition government. Um, it was paid for by a £50 additional levy on visas. The fund was scrapped. The levy remains. I think that's, that's a really important point because um, I'm sure many of you people in this room, a lot of people who come to this university, know all about paying for visa applications. It's expensive stuff. In order to earn your right to come to this country, if you're not an EU citizen, you have to go through, jump through a huge number of hoops. You have to be very highly qualified and you have to be able to afford that education, those qualifications, and simply the visa process. And you have to be able to understand it and it basically means that, globally speaking, we have freedom of movement for the rich, for the elite, right? For the poor, we have the refugee crisis, and I'm going to get to that. But what we've done, what we're doing now by <laughs> sticking up for the, you know, the, the working class communities that have been left behind and, and getting rid of freedom of movement, is we're applying that same logic here in the EU. So freedom of movement was brilliant. For, well, is still, remains, we've still got it for now. Um, is brilliant for so many reasons, but one of the key things is that it, it opens up the opportunities of migration to everyone, 
Globally, that's only an option for the rich. If you're really rich, you can come here. You don't have to be able to speak English if you can make a significant contribution to uh, British business. So what we're doing by getting rid of freedom of movement is we are benefiting the rich only, who will still be able to move around, and we are pricing out the poor from the benefits of moving. That's the British poor and that's the European poor, and we're putting the exact same um, issues on them as what is fundamentally driving the migration crisis at our gates. Those are the people who can't get a visa, and they still need the benefits of immigration. Um, and the theatre goes on. The theatre goes on, so the last government came for the benefits tourists. Well, it turns out there weren't any. So um, <laughs> getting rid of them didn't bring our net migration down. So what are we going to do now? We're just going to come out with it and go for the doctors. Because if you really want to reduce immigration, you have to go for ordinary, hardworking people who are part of our communities, who are working in our NHS, who are working in our universities, students. You know, these are the new demons. We're not even talking about scroungers anymore. It's foreign, foreign, bad. And that is a really bad place to be. Um, and there's more theater. I mean, I want to talk for a moment about the Great Wall of Calais. Now, I think that this has several angles to it. One of them is the, the politics of the catchphrase, right? This government's great, great at it. We have the great repeal bill, the great wall of Calais, and it makes a great headline, and that's what this is all about. It's not really about, I mean, honestly, if you think about the people who are in the Calais jungle, I think I'm right in saying that the largest nationality represented there is Sudanese. Now, if you're Sudanese and you're in the Calais jungle, You've escaped an incredibly repressive regime. You may well have experienced torture in that place. You have then crossed the Sahara Desert, evaded traffickers, um, been smuggled across the Mediterranean, survived that perilous journey. You may have been sent back at various points. You may have started again. Um, you have crossed the entirety of Europe without getting detained and sent back to Turkey under this agreement or back to you know, somewhere else under another agreement or whatever, and you have reached um, a place that is filthy and squalid, and you have lived there in a tent in the mud, and then you come across a 13-foot bit of concrete, and that's what's going to turn you back. That's it. That is not going to deter anyone. It's going to make life harder. It's going to make life more dangerous. That's what our border controls do for immigrants. But it doesn't stop immigration, because those people don't have anywhere to go back to, right? You, you go home, no, that, that, that's not an option. It just doesn't exist. The smugglers don't do return trips. Although I have heard of a smuggler <laughs> getting somebody to pay more on the basis that they would theoretically bring them back if they didn't like it. But it, would, it was lies. Um, that, that wall and the accompanying secure zone in Calais is costing us 17 million pounds. Now, you may remember that last summer, I think it was June or July, they announced a different, completely different, secure zone in Calais at the cost of 12 million pounds. It was only fences then. It wasn't a wall. Totally different, totally useless, and a huge, huge waste of money. And that is a real, that is the real crux of this issue. And this is where I think that, you know, we, we've, we talk about needing to change this conversation, and, and fellow panelists have spoken very eloquently about the fact that it's, you know, it's, it's actually austerity and, and, and underfunded public services and stuff that are affecting people's lives. It's not immigration. That's correct. But that argument, we've made it. <laughs> I've tried. We failed. So we need to think of new ways of talking about this. And I think that this is one of them. Um, that, that's a choice. You know, 17 million pounds for a wall is a choice to fund hatred and division, quite literally. Um, at the extent, that's money that's not being put into our communities. That's money that's not paying for hospital beds and uh, for school places. Uh, the, the Migration Impact Fund slash Controlling Immigration Fund is a textbook example of this. It's a choice. You're putting money into hatred. You're putting money into punishment of people who don't deserve it. You're not putting that same money into building up the communities and sticking up for the left behind that you tout in your speeches. Um, there's a really good report that I really recommend people taking a look at that came out just the last week um, by the ODI. And it looks at the cost that all this border control is actually, you know, how much we're actually spending in Europe on border control. Um, it looks at how much we're spending on fences, quite literally. It looks at how much we spent on 
you know, high-tech equipment for surveillance, and it looks how much we're spending to pay off other governments around the world to contain their migrant populations. And it's not just, it doesn't begin and end at the EU-Turkey deal. We're doing this all over the world. We have been for decades. We pay off dictatorial, repressive regimes to prevent their populations from leaving, from escaping, to prevent other populations from transiting. And we do it at a massive cost to ourselves. So we are spending this money, and it is a choice. You fund one horrific policy, and you don't fund the hospitals, the schools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the things we need to build up our communities, the things we need that will make people actually have dignified lives. And it's happening on such a scale. I mean, billions and billions and billions and billions. And the key thing that this ODI report, so not me, I've been banging on about this for ages, but now the ODI has said it too. So I hope it will hold some credibility. The key thing is that it doesn't work. All of that money has been wasted. You may have noticed that there's been a bit more of that refugee stuff happening in Europe lately, even after decades of spending billions doing everything we can think of to be as awful as we possibly can to keep them out. They are coming in greater numbers. And why? Because they have hope. And that is one thing that you can't build a, a wall to get rid of, right? So let's, let's talk about hope, because about 150 days ago or something like that, some of us um, stood on a stage down the road at UCL and tried to bring a message of hope. And we, we still had hope then. We thought, you know, we need to rally the people. We need to fight against the xenophobia of this campaign. But overall, we're going to remain, right? And uh, we can do it. And then we can change Europe. And that was a message of hope. And I've got little of that message to bring to you now, if I'm honest. <coughs> um, I've got some other stuff now. I've got a lot of rage huge amount of rage. And I've got determination, because I'm not going to shut up. I'm not going to watch this country, my country, our country, go down the road that it's going down. Not on our watch. No, sir. We all need to stand up now, more than ever, more than during the referendum campaign. I wish we'd done it more then, but now. We need to stand up and talk about those choices. And I think that what we can start doing is having those conversations close to home. And let's recognize that everybody, everybody, I mean, there may be like really, really minor exceptions to this, but everybody, even the working class families, even the people in Stockport where you grew up, everybody can have a conversation with their family and go one, two, three generations back and somebody moved for a better life. They didn't necessarily cross a border, but they definitely moved. And they probably crossed a border quite recently. If you look back in your families, somebody did that. Somebody did, we've all done it. All human beings have moved. Throughout the course of history, human history has been one of movement and migration. The and we need, it's, it's scary. I mean, we've all seen the pictures of the wars in, war in Syria. They're horrific. God, they're always on my timeline. It makes me want to die. It, we've all seen the images of the people on the boats, and we all saw the Breaking Point poster, but we, very few of us, I mean, I, I happen to work with refugees, but very few of us have actually ever met an asylum seeker. So they feel very foreign and very scary, and we can demonize them. But in our own families, every single one of us have a history of movement. We all do. It, it, it's the reality. There is no switch to turn it off. It will not stop. The only sensible, credible, grown-up thing to do now is to reimagine a world where we make the most of human mobility, where we manage human mobility, where we do not try to hide it behind a wall because it will not go away. So, <laughs> our campaign to remain in the EU on the basis of these progressive values was not in vain. It was good that we did it. It was right that we did it. Unfortunately, we have to keep going and we have to try harder and I really hope that every single one of us feels the personal responsibility to stand up and be part of that. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe, and I'll pass you straight over to Yanis Varoufakis from DM. 
Well, thank you so much. It's a great honor and uh, pleasure to be uh, offered the opportunity of wrapping up this uh, wonderful panel's uh, contribution to the very sad question, what went wrong, and to the very hopeful question, what next? Before that, uh, allow me, while I was listening to you, I was reminded of a conversation I had, I think it was around last week here in London. It was a conversation with uh, a member of the House of Lords, a prominent Brexiteer whose name is not going to be mentioned. Uh, but I think it was quite interesting. Uh, he was explaining to me why regaining control of immigration in this country is so important to sovereignty, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know, but it's always nice to have some stereotypes reinforced. Um, <laughs> And I, while we were having this very friendly conversation, I was reminded of something that happened to me in the 1980s. It was the pinnacle, of what I thought was the pinnacle of my existence when I got a, a junior, junior fellowship at Trinity College, Cambridge. And I, upon arriving, I was met by the master of the college who asked me a question over Sherry. And the question was, how, um, my dear boy, how does it feel for a young gentleman from the Orient to be inducted <laughs> into polite society? <laughs> so I was reminded of that question. And I, I, last week, I told my interlocutor from the House of Lords, the Brexiteer, I said, it seems to me that this is what you want back. You want to have the opportunity and the legal right to choose whom you induct into your polite, which is white, society. Yeah? Uh, and you just didn't like the idea that any Romanian could just walk in without you having the opportunity to pose that question. And you know what you said? Yes. <laughs> yes, this comes is part and parcel of national sovereignty. So now I'm going to try to sum up. And you, you will excuse me if I stand up. I need to activate myself. and as as a young chap, from, or what used to be a young chap from the Orient, I need to gesticulate and... <laughs> now, before the referendum, I think more or less the same lot, and certainly DiEM25 and another Europe is possible, um, we joined forces. And we joined forces for the same simple reason. It was, impos it was absolutely essential that we should argue for our campaign, our reason as to why Britain should stay in the UK. Their slogan we used, if I recall, Owen was, in the EU and against this EU. That was our line. In town hall meetings, on the streets, on radio, television, newspaper, articles, uh, we campaigned to convince the people of this country that another Europe is possible. We failed. On the 23rd of June, the people of Britain opined that another Europe is not possible, aided and abetted by the official Remain campaign that was disrespectful of voters, of the truth, even of arithmetic. Brexit won. <laughs> so the question now is, how can progressive politics be inv invigorated in this post-Brexit world? How can we salvage the genuine advantages that this otherwise problematic European Union has conferred upon the people of Britain and every member state of the European Union? How can we prevent a bonfire of rights to environmental standards, to labor standards, to the freedom from those scars on the face of the earth, also known as border fences? This is the question that we are here to uh, address. And before we do this, we have to grasp the constituents and extent of our failure. We must not blame it on anyone else. And here is my assessment of the constituents of our failure. To a people craving instant, immediate change and a drubbing of the status quo, we offered a worthy policy in and against the EU a policy which, nonetheless, we would need to be in government to implement it on the 24th of June. And yet, we were nowhere near government. And we are nowhere near government. So if Remain had won on the 23rd of June, is it not true 
that we wouldn't be in 10 Downing Street to implement what we were proposing, which is another Europe, a confrontation with Brussels from within. So from where I'm standing, a, the remain, a, a remain victory would be grist to the mill of the David Camerons, the Tony Blairs, the IMF, the Bank of England, the Bilderberg crowd, and would be interpreted by the establishment as a license to do business as usual. The one thing that voters oppose more than anything. Now, does this mean that we were wrong to oppose Brexit? Of course it doesn't. Of course we were right to oppose Brexit. But what it does mean is that it was not foolish of voters to vote for Brexit. Voters, at least, who were hankering change had reasons to turn their back on us. They just didn't believe us. The lesson here is very simple. Unless we back up our views on Europe, on Britain, on Scotland, on England, on Wales, with a surge throughout the country that will see these views being implemented, from the commanding heights of 10 Downing Street, the people will turn to those who offer them a realistic change now, even if it is the wrong kind of change. Taking a more distant Archimedean perspective, our defeat is fragrant of the overarching progressive forces' failure to harness the anti-establishment rage caused by two simple facts. That for 40 years now, 80% of the people, 95% of the time, are taken to the cleaners by the top 20% of the privileged ones. that for 30 years now, 30% 30 of the people are being taken, are being discarded persons, treated as men and women whose opinions do not matter, squeezed out of the sphere of influence by the tyranny of the shifting median voter. You want to really know why Brexit won? Look at the official statistics of this nation. For the last 13 years, the median voter continuously lost real purchasing power if you take into consideration housing costs. This is the first time it has happened for 13 years since 1819. This is, well, to paraphrase, let me paraphrase Bill Clinton, it is the austerity stupid. <laughs> now, austerity has a slight difficulty even on its own terms. It is self-defeating, and it produces misery at a large scale. And misery acquaints a man with strange bedfellows. And I have not chosen a line from te The Tempest by at random, because in our era's Tempest today, we are experiencing a massive political shake-up shake up throughout the Western world that has not been seen since, since the 1930s. And the reason, allow me to be an economist just for one fleeting second, <laughs> is that for the first time since the 1930s, we are gripped by a great deflation on both sides of the Atlantic. I'm not going to delve into the economics, but let me say that 15 trillion of bonds is now trading at negative interest rates. Negative interest rates are deflationary. Deflation breeds monsters. Think 1930s. Now, I have news for you. Well, it's not news for you. It's news for people who are not here. Uh, just like no British government can deal on its own with climate change, no British government can deal on its own with this great deflation. This is the great deflation that is breeding a great discontent. And that is the underlying cause of Brexit. Now, Passion is returning to politics, but unfortunately, not in the way we want it. Passion is now fueled by fear, a fear that yields loathing. Loathing of the other, the foreigner, who becomes a proxy for the unseen economic forces, condemning masses of people to the heap of the discarded. Workers who are too expensive and too indebted to be coveted by employers or by bankers. Now, before the referendum, some of us were ag aghast when fellow progressives, fellow left-wingers, backed Brexit, hoping that it would lead 
to the split up of the Tory party and would allow the left to reconnect with the working class, a working class lured by UKIP. We warned them of their folly. We warned that the Tories, the quintessential class warriors, unlike Labour, would never be divided, for they know how to salvage defeat. Defeat? That is wrong. They know how to salvage unity from the jaws of disunity and defeat, because they know how to prioritize the services they provide to the class of their choice, to the ruling class. If only Labour could do the same, what a wonderful world it would be. <laughs> we warned them against the illusion that it was possible to win a bidding war against right-wing isolationists and xenophobes by offering a light version of immigration phobia. Our world today is shaped by a monumental new fungal political clash, not only in Britain, but on the continent and in the United States. On the one side, there is what I call the global troika. Nothing to do with the troika that I was negotiating with. Well, actually a lot to do with it, but not the same. It's a troika of globalization, financialization, and neoliberalism, the establishment. They are represented by the likes of David Cameron, of Tony Blair, whom I mentioned before, Hillary Clinton, the triangle linking Brussels, Frankfurt, and Berlin, and so on. Opposing this global troika is an emergent nationalist international of right-wing Brexiteers, Donald Trump, Le Pen, Golden Dawn. I'm not going to go through this endless list. Now, the trouble with this clash between the establishment, the, the global troika, and the nationalist international that is emerging as its enemy is that it is both real and misleading. That it is real, we know this. We've seen Brexit. Brexit was a slap across the global troika. It was not a slap across necessarily the British establishment, or at least not all of it. So it was real, but at the same time it's misleading. And it is misleading because the global establishment and the, national, the nationalist international are accomplices. They're not enemies. They feed off each other. Witness the very easy transformation of Theresa May from being a Remainer to being a hard Brexiter. They are effectively feeding off each other and in a self-mutual reinforcement mechanism with one another. Now, to break up this fake opposition that is poison, poisoning our politics and our environment in the end, we need a progressive international. It is this progressive international that we at DiEM25 are putting together, are building throughout Europe. But let me get, let me get back to the referendum for a second. How should progressive internationalists deal with the aftermath of that awful Brexit outcome? Now, here's an idea. Our first task should be recon to reconfirm in our hearts and minds that we were right to oppose Brexit. Already it is becoming obvious that my favorite allegory or uh, line of Hotta California's final verse is proving accurate. We showed that you can check out any time, but that leaving is an utter mess. The paradoxes mount. Do free marketeer Brexiteers truly believe that it's logically coherent to address Europeans on the continent and say to them, Britain is open for business, um, but we don't want you here. <laughs> now, how much intelligence does it take to realize that this whole argument about Brexit, that the purpose of it was to become extroverted and to look to the rest of the world instead of looking inside within the continent of Europe, which is shrinking anyway because of austerity and the Troika and, and the Eurozone and so on. This is all correct. Yes, you want to be extroverted, so what are you doing? You're voting for Brexit? You'll spend the next 10 years negotiating with the European Union. You're going to be employing thousands of civil servants to be utterly dependent with Brussels. You're never going to get a chance to talk to the Chinese because you will be too busy talking to Brussels about what you're going to do with the customs union without re-erecting a border fence between Northern Ireland and the Republic. <laughs> Our second task should be to prevent 
a major error. I think others have spoken about this, but I have to repeat it. We must not turn against those who turned their backs on us, those who voted for leave. The balance was tipped in favor of Brexit by those who yearned for change, for the change that we failed to convince them that we could deliver. So instead of talking down upon them, we should accept the responsibility for our failure and convince them that we can gain power to implement in the House of Commons, on in 10 Downing Street, through Whitehall, to implement a progressive internationalist economic and political agenda within a Europe that we are confronting while staying within it. Our third task should be to put forward a roadmap for Brexit that respects our democratic agenda and our progressive internationalism. Now, I understand why some of you on the 24th of June began dreaming of a second referendum. It was a colossal error. It was a mistake. Let me remind you of what happened in 2008, next door from here, in Ireland. The Irish voted in a referendum against the Lisbon Treaty. Hmm? And what happened? Brussels asked them to have the referendum again until they delivered the right outcome. And they were threatened that they will have it again every, every Sunday, they would have a referendum. <laughs> now, is this what we want to do? Especially in an environment where there are no remainers left except for those in here. Everybody else is going to ground. I believe not. So here is a proposal, three-part proposal. First, demand that Theresa May triggers Article 50 yesterday. This is in accordance with the Brexit outcome. This gives us two years from the moment it's activated. At the very same time, demand that conservatives, small C conservatives, should want to conserve that needs to be conserved and to avoid uncertainty and chaos. So we should demand that the government announces that at the end of this two-year period, it will have settled for a Norway of the shelf EEA-like agreement for, that should last at least a full parliamentary term after that two-year period is, is finished. So that the British Parliament has an opportunity fully and openly to debate and to include the British public through participator, participatory means in this debate what kind of future it wants. Thirdly, commit to having this parliament or the parliament after that decide amongst the different varieties of potential arrangements. This way we shall have a seven year period of certainty for business and of people whose lives straddle the, U the United Kingdom and the continent. At least one full parliament after the two year period is finished that has the time and the space to, to debate the kind of links Britain wants with the rest of Europe. And thirdly, simultaneous respect for voters who opted out of the European Union, who voted for Brexit by triggering Article 50, and for voters aghast at the thought that a small circle of inane insiders are going to negotiate behind closed doors on the future of Britain. Now, this proposal offers progressives in this country a lengthy period, a seven-year period, during which we can succeed in doing that which we failed to do on the 23rd of June, to show to the good people of Britain that they do not need to settle for bad change overseen by their own regressive isol isolationist type of government, that good government in the United Kingdom is a realistic prospect opening up the road towards strong links with a better Europe. Now, wrapping up. Brexit, I am convinced about this, is just a mere symptom of a disintegrating Europe that causes the xenophobic right to be rising everywhere, just like it did after 1929, that generation's 2008. New electrified fences are rising up everywhere. Hope's candle is trembling in the cold wind of a nationalism that is fanned by universal pan-European austerity. 
We cannot find this ill wind except through revoking once more the old adage, divided we fall, united we stand. Today, the reason why those of us from DiEM25 are here is because our organizations, another Europe is possible, and DiEM25 are taking decisive steps in this direction. We are here to discuss the joining up and the joining forces between our organizations. I'm gratified that our members, thousands of DiEM members from Ireland to Turkey, yes, Turkey, and from uh, Finland all the way to Portugal are enthusiastic about this. I'm also chuffed that the internal poll of uh, another European uh, possible members um, delivered its verdict. They're very much in favor of this merger. This is why we're here. Since its formation on the 9th of February, last February in Berlin, DiEM25 has been trying to do in every European Union member state and in European countries that are not in the European Union, that which another Europe is possible has been violently trying in this country to create an alliance of progressives that see change in our nations intertwined with progressive change throughout Europe. It is this internationalism that we covet. Now, the referendum was a slap across our faces. There's no doubt about that. Voters looked at us in the eye and said, mate, I don't believe you that another Europe is possible. We need to change their minds. We need to convince them that another Europe is possible. The only way of changing their mind in this country is by demonstrating that another Britain, the Britain they want, is possible, and it is only possible in another Europe. And explaining to them convincingly with an agenda, with a political program that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. That includes economic policy, it includes constitutional issues, how that other Britain in another Europe is possible. This means that another Europe is possible as a slogan, as an organization, must now spread its wings beyond the national borders of this country. And can only do this powered by a genuinely pan-European movement. And DiEM25 is this movement. We refuse, as an organization, to become a confederacy of national chapters and national organizations. We demonstrate our disrespect of borders by not having any within our organization. Now, there are underst I understand this when I talk to uh, uh, friends and comrades in Poland, in Hungary, that organizations that grew up within a certain national context feel jealous of their own identity and organization. We respect this. But let me remind you something that Winston Churchill once said in his advocacy of Brexit. Yes, he was an advocate of Brexit. He once wrote, if you don't believe me, just listen to this, we are with Europe, but not of it. We are linked but not comprised. Well, DiEM25 implores you, don't be Churchillian. We must demonstrate to the people of Britain how we can work together towards a transnational pan-European movement that respects no borders. If we don't demonstrate that another Europe is possible by leaving behind our national-based organizations, who will demonstrate it? But enough words, let's join forces, let's prove to ourselves that when the stakes are genuinely high, it is possible for progressive politics, unlike true love, to run smooth. <coughs> there is no time to spare. We have a continent to reclaim for the sake of our, of our forsaken peoples. Thank you. everyone and thank you to such a fantastic panel who during a time that's starting to seem quite hopeless actually not only just gave us a few nuggets of hope but actually 
clear actions that we can take away, clear ideas that we can build on, and not just providing hope for the future, but a pathway towards creating something better. So I will hand you over to Luke, who will tell you when you're back from lunch. And um, yeah, thank you. Let's give another round of applause to our panel. Wow, what a fantastic uh, session that was. Um, I suggest that we take at the same length of time that we were planning to have for lunch, which was 45 minutes. Um, there are lots of places nearby um, in that you can get like tea and coffee and sandwiches from um, on Kingsway. Uh, when you go in and out of the building, please make sure that you're displaying your visitor sticker um, because that's important for the LSE security. And uh, yeah, see you, see you in 45 minutes. So we'll reconvene at 10 to... Ten to two. You were excellent. No, I said yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's got to be thing. the most like no, but uh, your the dimension you're bringing to it. So.